Hey guys, Social Slings here. Uh, this is a part two to a uh, to another video. Uh, if you haven't watched part one, I recommend you do so, so that way you basically know what I'm talking about uh, here. Uh, and yeah, no, uh, thank you for um, thank you for um, uh, clicking on this video, and I hope you enjoy it. To be able to un then understand the United States even further and more marginalized fu fu uh, functions, we need not to go to um, just, you know, black people or other minorities within the United States, we also must understand also the different forms of oppression uh, towards women and also to towards women of both cisgender women and transgender women here in the United States of America. Quote, our sex has produced only one monster, Marie Antoinette. While for four years we have been betrayed, assassinated by monsters without number, uh, without number of the masculine sex. Our rights are those of the people, and if we are and if we are oppressed, we will know how to provide resistance to oppression. Claire Lacan, addressed to Monsieur Robespierre in the convention. This quote best illustrates actually the kind of sexism that would occur in the United States of America in its conception. The forms of sexism that occurred in the United States of America is like that of France where women played a huge role in the history of the revolutions of 1773 to 1822 and major events throughout the history and events of these countries uh, from feudalism and our current political struggles today in capitalism. Yet they have been under under uh, mind of their significance in their role of a huge amount through a huge amount of time, and not even mentioned in histor in historical analyses of women in these events, which is not something to be surprised of. Women's oppression itself emerged from the first class society, as in slavery, was a step uh, where as class society slavery was established and used women as slaves to breeding pro uh, for breeding. For breeding and production more hu of more humans, uh, to be considered as property to build cities and towns around the region around regions where the slaveholdery would live and keep their enslaved in chains to build more towns for them and thus be able to get profit out of the actual products that they just produced themselves and uh, as a claim of ownership. Women were oppressed in the earliest form in the earliest form of class struggle by being considered as property and objects that is to be used by men to have sexual intercourse with for breeding human children to grow a lineage of the slaveholdery and to make a bigger population of the enslaved for higher productivity of production of goods and services to be provided to the pleasure of the slaveholdery that owned the enslaved. Women were thus enslaved from the process so that from from this process so that so that where the slaveholdery can have more control and ensure that there's more of a breeding process of the enslaved that uh, that was able to act in favor of the given slaveholder this is how it worked from 3000 BCE to 4 to 456 AD when slavery was a full-blown economic system and dominated the entire world and played a, a huge significance the particular form of how women would be enslaved was different from the rest from the rest of the male enslaved, where the males were just conquered by others and forced by swords and spears uh, pressed on their backs to be slaves, or them being purchased by other slaveholders. Women, specifically during slavery, was enslaved by marriage in a social con uh, constructive idea considered as the family that emerged in slavery and continued to occur across the other class societies like feudalism and capitalism but in different forms and different uses with each given mode of production of this class society. In feudalism, marriage was used to be able to marry off members of a landlord family to marry, uh, to marry into another family to set up alliances and agreements, pacts, or peace treaties among certain landlord states in feudalism, as well as they were expected to have sex with each other to breed children, in, uh, to, breed children to inherit the thrones and offices of landlord positions. Then capitalism with their forms of marriage, although it is a lot more wide and is less patriarchal than previous forms of marriage and slavery and feudalism, it still holds a social construct that women are to be wed as a way to make a meritable um, matrimonial union to uh, to be about for women to having the, having to need men or live with men to take care of children to live uh, to live comfortably when capitalism in its mode of production has a huge overproduction rate that allows for there to be a huge distribution of goods as utilities for there to still be 78% of produce left around the world once the majority of it has been distributed thus launching a false idea of dependency towards men that women have to abide by under capitalism. 
to reference someone that talks about the subject in detail, quote, at the sight of the husband who embellishes his existence with a heris- with with heresism stands in the neglected wife, and one cannot have one side of this contradiction without the other any more than a man has a whole apple in his hand after eating half. But that seems to have been uh, the husband's notion until their wives taught them but better. With uh, the monogamous marriage, uh, two constant social types, unknown hitherto make the appearance of the scene of the white's indentant lover and the cuckold husband. The husbands had uh, and won the victory of the over the wise, and the vanquished and magnificently provided the crown, together with the uh, with the monogamous marriage and the and the heterism heterism adultery became an unavoidable social institution. Denounce now severally penalized but impossible to to suppress at best a certain uh pen- penalty of of child of the children rested on the moral convention as before and to solve the insuable contradiction the code napoleon art th- art 3 uh 12 decreed la enfante sazu portant le mariage a pu pari le mari the father of a child convicted during a marriage is the husband such is the final result of the 3,000 years of Montgomery's marriage. Thus, whatever the Montgomery's marriage uh, fa- I mean, family remains true to the historical origin and clearly reveals the antagonism between the man and the woman expressed in the man's ex- exclusive supremacy, it exhibits in a, in a miniature uh, the same oppositions and contradictions as those in which society has been moving, without power to resolve to overcome them ever since the split into classes at the beginning of civilization. I am speaking here, of course, only of those cases of the uh, Montgomery's marriage where mer- where matrimonial life actually proceeds according to the original character in the whole institution, but where the wife rebels against the husband's uh, supremacy. Not all marriages turn out uh, thus as nobody knows better than the German Philistine, who who can no more assert his rule in the home that uh, he can instate on whose wife every night uh, wears the trousers uh, he is unworthy of. But to make up for he for it, he considers himself far above his French companion in misfortune, to whom offend, to whom uh, oftener than to, than to him something much worse happens. End quote. Frederick Engels, Origins of the Family, Private Property, and the State. This quote from Engel, from Frederick Engels is a great introductory statement on the origins of women's oppression, and in the same chapter, he touches on how this origin is in place of the current forms of oppression of women in capitalism to this day. To continue on with Engels, to continue on with Engels' geniusness on this subject, we, I shall quote even more from or, from the origins of the family, prior property, and the state by Frederick Engels. Quote: Nowadays, there are two ways of concluding the a bourgeois marriage. In Catholic countries, the parents, as before, a pr- uh, uh, procure a suitable wife for their young bourgeois son, and the consequence is, of course, the fullest development of the contradiction inherent of the Montgomery. The husband abandons himself to the heterism, and the wife is uh, to adultery. Probably the only reason why the Catholic Church abolished divorce was because it had, convi- it had convinced itself that there is no more uh, that there is no more a cure for adultery than there is for death. In Protestant countries, on the other hand, the rule is that the son of the bourgeois family is allowed to choose a wife from his own class with more or less freedom. Hence, there are since there are there may there are there may be a certain element of love in the marriage, as indeed in accordance with the Protestant hypocrisy is all is always assumed for a di- for the uh, distancy sake. Here, the husband's uh, hatterism uh, is a more sleepy kind of business, and adultery by the wife is a, is less the is less the rule. But since in every kind of marriage people remain what they were before and since the bourgeois of the Pro- of Protestant countries are mostly Philistines, as as this Protestant mo- uh, Montgomery achieves taking the a- take, taking the average of of the best cases of the uh, conjugal partnership. Of the uh, lead of the lead in boredom, known as domestic bliss, the best mirror of of these two methods of marrying uh, of marrying is the not 
is a novel, the French novel of the Catholic manner of the German for the pro for the Protestant, and both hero gets them in the uh, German. The young the young man gets the girl in the French, uh, in the French. The husband gets the, ho the gets the horns. Which of them is worse off is sometimes questionable. This is this is why the French bourgeois as as much horrified by the dullness of the German novel as the German Philistine is by immor is by immorality immortality of the French of the French. However, now that Berlin is a world uh, is a world capital, the German novel is beginning with a little less timid timidity um, to to use as a part of its regular stock in trade and the hatterism and adultery long familiar to that town. In both cases, however, the ma uh, the marriage is condi is conditioned by the class positions of the parties and is to the extent always a marriage uh, of con of convenience. In both cases, this marriage uh, of convenience turns often enough into the cr and the crassest prostitution. Uh, sometimes of both partners, but far more commonly of the woman, who only differs from the ordinary uh, co courtesan uh, in that she does not let her out her body on piece of work or as a wage worker, but sells it once for once uh, for all into slavery. And of all marriages, convenience's four years words hold true, as a grammar two negatives of the affirmative and as the uh, matrimonial morality uh, two prostitutions pass. For a virtue, Charles Fourier, Fourier uh, de Ante Universal Paris. So basically, um, theory for a for a united universe. Uh, sex, love in the relationship with a woman becomes, uh, and and can only become a a real rule among oppressed classes, which means today among the proletariat, rather class. Whether this relation is officially sanctioned or not, but here all the foundations of the typical mongami um, are cleared away. Here there is no property property of the representatives and the inheritance which uh, monogamy uh, and male supremacy were established. Hence, there is no there is no incentive to make this male supremacy effective. What is more, there are there are no means of making it so. Bourgeois law, which pro which protects the supremacy, exists in the possessing class in their dealings with the proletarians. The law costs money, and and on account of the worker's pro poverty, and there is no validity for his relation to his wife. Here, quite other personal and social conditions decide. And now, a large scale industry has taken a wife into the home onto the labor market into the factory and made her often breed uh, a breadwinner of the family uh, no basis of any kind of male supremacy is left to the proletarian household except perhaps for something of the brutality towards women that have spread since the introduction of, mon of monogamy the proletarian family is therefore less uh, monogamous in the strict sense of where of where there is passionate love and the firmest loyalty on both on both sides, and maybe all the blessings of religious and civil authority. Here, therefore, the eternal attendance of uh, monogamy, heterism, uh, and adultery play on only in an almost uh, vanishing part. The wife has, in fact, regard regard regained the right to dissolve the marriage, and if two people cannot get on the on one another, they prefer to separate. In short, proletarian marriage is monogamous, and the and the etymological sense of the word, but not all in, it, in its historical sense. End quote. Frederick Engels. Origins of the family, prior property, and the state. This means so many things, but also basically means uh, a lot of things that basically that is needs to be understood about capitalism and women in general, and how this actually even applies to the United States. All women are oppressed in capitalism due to the fact that they are so dependent either to men that, that, that commit to wage slavery, or that women themselves go through wage slavery as well. Either bourgeois women or either bourgeois women or proletarian women, they are oppressed. Of course, the proletarian is more oppressed than a bourgeois woman, however. The bourgeois woman is subjected to the social standards and beauty standards that creates massive amounts of natural anxiety uh, towards them, as well as the fact they uh, they will not get as much attention as they need due to them having... having uh, due to them or their love interests owning private property and having to maintain it. However, the proletarian woman is more is more depressing. 
not only are they subjected to the, to the beauty stand, not only are they subjected to the same beauty standards, but most of them, uh, but for most of them, it's too expensive or they can't even afford it. Then they have to go to work and, and they have to work hard and take care of their family with them, working at the house, taking care of people, or the or they themselves working in order to be, in order for the amount of money value labor time they perform to the workday, be cut in order to maintain the prior property they work at from their board from from their bourgeois employer. They are alienated from society, their loved ones, and themselves. This especially applies to marriage, where women are usually expected to basically have beauty standards and basically apply themselves to be more beautiful and to be very pretty for their husbands that basically go to work. But then at the same time, most especially proletarian families are not able to actually make enough money to the point where they actually could basically sustain that and to the point where it actually causes antagonistic relationships between relationships between the proletarian family and of itself, as well as the fact that in both parts of the family, it basically creates a structure and it creates an idea that women have to be dependent towards men in order to live comfortably, rather than that comfortability being provided as a right entirely. For even a long time within U.S. history, women weren't even allowed to ha allowed to write the vote, even uh, even on even after the American Civil War. Women were uh, given the right to vote very late uh, in the United States' history. Women weren't even allowed to vote until August until August 18th of 1920, when the 19th Amendment was passed, where women were given the right to vote. But even then, that was in that was so very little, and that was only a response against uh, against uh, Louis S. Bryant's uh, declaration that at least the so at least Soviet Russia were able to actually give women the right to vote unconditionally when the Soviet government was established, which is a lot more you could say about the United States government, despite the fact the United States government claims to be more free and claimed to be more free than the Bolsheviks during the Russian Revolution. And this factor, this in this factor. The world entirely, um, the world entirely was given, uh, so, the world was essentially given so much advantages and since the emergence of class society to the dominance of where men could basically dominate over women since the, since the start of slavery itself as an entire dominant economic system and continued throughout the rest of class society. And this is even more prevalent and even more well known within capitalism today, even with the right to vote that women have and even with the ability that women can have uh, to basically be able to work same jobs as men. This doesn't actually address the complete patriarchal system of capitalism and how it affects women. What, what giving the right to vote to women and also having women basically be integrated into the same jobs as men really does is that it allows women to basically still participate in the same bureaucratic uh, political system that ignores them and still excludes them from anything. And as well, it allows for women to still then be exploited um, as, as, their male, as their male brethren. The only difference is really the sex, but all it really does is allow women to basically integrate themselves a part of the same oppressive and bureaucratic structure of of capitalism, not not abolishing the same not abolishing the bureaucratic structure and abolishing uh, the capitalist system as a whole. Thus, because of this. Is that thus because of this even with um, the certain amounts of like rights that women do have, and even with these certain uh, structures that women essentially do play a part compared to since the emergence of capitalism, these still do not address the actual patriarchal system and the actual economic coercion that women have to go through every time. That is a lot more repressive and a lot more oppressive compared to men, both for cisgender women and transgender women. That is why still here in the United States, when women basically would want to get a divorce from their husbands, the husband would have to be able to sign the papers in order to make the divorce legitimate. Despite the fact that the woman itself already have stated uh, that she would want a divorce and that she desires for a divorce due to abuse and due to other uh, conditions and other problems that she might have with the husband. And yet it's still the husband at the end of the day that has to sign the papers in order for the woman to actually be free, which entails that basically the male still has some form of control and still has some form of actual ownership over women during marriage in the legal system of the United States of America. 
completely still creating a cultural patriarchal idea that women are basically considered objects and they should be considered objects to men. When in reality, women have just as much as a right and they have just as much as freedom compared to men when it comes to the actual existence at hand. And if it wasn't for women in the first place, they wouldn't even be able to have a, a structural population in the first place and wouldn't even be able to have a major the major things that they've been able to get today yet none of that is usually stated at all because it's still on a predicated idea that women are usually have to be able to be controlled or they might seem uh, problematic or they might or they might seem uh, rebellious against all, all over society when the only reason they are problematic and the only reason that they could be rebellious is because of the overall coercive structure and bureaucratic structure and exploitive and alienating structure of capitalism that basically inflicts that upon them in the first place. Only when women themselves with their own guns and with their own weapons being able to actually smash the patriarchal system of capitalism and being able to destroy it will they actually choose to be free. As we are speaking about this right now, Roe v. Wade, the resolutions of Roe v. Wade that declared that the Fourth Amendment covers the bodily autonomy for women to have reproductive rights within the United States has been overturned, which basically means abortion is no longer federally protected by law in the United States of America. Because of this, this basically allows um, many women in the United States today to be to be to be vulnerable to econ to economic depravity and also even more uh, problems within within the United States, as well as the fact it creates a ban on abortion where more children, as I even say in the beginning of this video, will die due to the la due to this economic wars and due to economic poverty, which de completely defeats the purpose of quote unquote banning abortion to save lives of children, which it doesn't save lives of children, it just makes children live more insecure lives uh, like in poverty. And that's, and that's the reality at hand when we cover topics like abortion and reproductive rights for women. As well as the fact, in meiosis of pregnancy, it is, it is, it is shown that a human life is not usually considered uh, among the fetus, and they're not usually considered a fetus until telophase 2. And telophase 2 is the final phase within, within meiosis, um, a part within the meiosis structure of pregnancy. And that, and that is really the only point where you can basically consider that to be a human life, which only occurs towards the end of pregnancy, in other words, in the third trimester. Because the separation between the chromosomes of the sperm cell and the A cell is still not separated, and the fetus itself is making up of 46 chromosomes, while the, while the, while the actual gamete chromosome rate for humans are 23 chromosomes. Which basically even shows in science that basically a fetus is indeed alive because all eggs are alive. Sperm cells are alive. The cells in general are like the smallest piece of life that basically helps us live in the first place. They may, they may be alive, but they're, but they're not necessarily considered a human life until they reach telophase 2. Because that's how most organisms uh, are able to actually be considered alive in the first place within, the, within, bio, within biological science. This, this entire process is called meiosis, and this process of meiosis applies to plant cells, animal cells, and many other things, but also applies to gamete cells, i.e. sexual cells that are able to actually create the fetus in the first place, in which we are able to create as well. It's, this process is known meiosis, and this, and this is how organisms are able to st start out as cells and then become to actual full-blown organisms like you and I, or, at, or like a part of the Animalia kingdom, or other organisms a part of the plant kingdom, or the bacteria kingdom. Therefore, not only is this false, um, the idea that basically life is conceived in conception, which is only mildly true if you basically understand how meiosis and pregnancy works, but also, second, um, but also, second, it, it, it basically also uh, ignores the ability that that fetus and those cells are in the woman's body and they have the right to be able to then declare themselves on like what that should be, the, what, sh what they should do with it because it, that's a part of their privacy. Even even the resolution of Roe versus Wade uh, in ni in nineteen seventy in nineteen seventy five that is stated that with a Fourth Amendment does cover the ability for not only people to be able to have the right to privacy on their own property but also entails the right to have the have the right of their privacy to their own body as well, 
which that that thus means that women are have the ability to basically get an abortion because that is a part of their own choice with what they do with their own buying a part of their privacy. Which means by overturning this resolution, not only does this threaten the ability for women to be able to get an abortion and be able to have reproductive rights, but also it threatens freedom of all people in general to privacy. No longer are you basically then entitled to the right of to not to the right to be searched um, without to the right to not be searched without a search warrant by the police. That's not that's no longer applicable today since that since that entire resolution and that logic among the Fourth Amendment has now been overturned. In other words, by overturning this legislation, we are threatened of our Fourth Amendment rights to be able to have the right to privacy. But then again. Our right of privacy has already been threatened with the NSA with the NSA agreement in the Patriot Act that allows the the National Security Agency and the Federal Bureau of Intelligence and NSA and FBI to spy on countless people all around the world, including Americans, without their knowledge through computer cameras and also through uh, phone signaling and other things that basically uh, requires for many companies to actually use within phones and computers to this day. But all this not only shows that basically this struggle for women's liberation against women's oppression is not only oppression against women, is not only oppression against the feminine sex, but it's also oppression against everyone. These kinds of policies, these kinds of actions are the things that basically affect everyone, especially in capitalism, where basically these little things that basically can oppress women also have the ability to oppress men as well, as they are in the lowest of the low of the class system, uh, in the working class as well. Because it is the work, because it is the working men that is in in capitalism that to be able to basically provide for working women in the first place in marriage, uh, in order for them to actually live comfortably, assuming that they are married. In other words, as most people would say, putting food on the table and having a roof over your head. They have to be able to work to do that. And the only reason they have to be able to work to do that is because we live in a system where we are so dependent on money and we're so dependent on the system of exchange that basically we treat money and we treat the ability for us to exchange money for goods and services as our God. As our God and for us to be able to actually be able to get anything done within this world and to get and to be able to actually live comfortably in a in a world where we are so alienated from ourselves or so alienated from from society uh, that we have more relationships to money itself than to our own loved ones this concept in of itself is even known as commodity fascism and it especially affects women a lot when they are essentially coerced to basically live under this social construct of dependency towards men and even if they aren't as socially constructed to basically do this, they still have to basically apply to many beauty standards and many different uh, ideologues uh, about women's beauty and, and different social constructs of beauty in the first place that are, guess what, usually made up of beauty organizations, mostly made up of men to declare how they think women should look like. This entire structure of basically making some form of dominance uh, towards women under like this male gaze and this male... Um, hierarchy to, against women is 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 indeed a problem but to say that this is a problem with all men is wrong as i said this is a class struggle as well and this thing also basically affects the men as well but it is also foolish enough to then say that basically that women do not face a huge brunt of this and that women do not face a huge oppression from this because they do statistically speaking they do it is even it is even known that women are are less are actually uh, three times more less to be are three times less to be paid uh, compared uh, compared to men within the United States e even with those women having high paying jobs and this is even known as the quote unquote wage gap within the United States of America this wage gap is usually debunked by saying that that most women basically choose low paying jobs now. That is indeed true within the study, but this is also ignoring the factor in the study that it states that basically women have to basically choose these low-paying jobs because most high-paying jobs are usually chosen by men first, and that men are the ones that basically are chosen first despite the fact that women basically apply to these high-paying jobs. And as well as the fact, it also ignores that in the same study that basically states the wage gap, that it also states that even with women having these high paying jobs same as men they still face a three times less uh they, they still face a three times less um weight uh, wage gap compared to men within within these within these high paying jobs 
And this is actually very profitable in the first place for the bourgeoisie because it is able to actually have more workers divide each other over the wages and over their entire uh, structure of their of their economy and be, creates basically this uh, false consciousness between a struggle between men and women in the first place rather than understanding the pure class struggle as well between the working class as a whole against the owning class as a whole. And these entire structures have been going on since almost the conception of the United States as well, just as the same as the conception of France uh, and its bourgeois state and the establishment of capitalism as a whole. And these kinds of things that are still around and some of these policies that still affect women today, such as the idea of marriage the so as a social construct and also the various policies that basically oppress them are still around and still affect many people today and still have a major issue among women uh, today as well. As stated by Women in, Cl and Women in Class Towards a Socialist Feminism by Hale... Oh my god. As stated in Women in Class Towards a Socialist Feminism by Hale Draper, he says, quote, If we assume the case, which is certainly not possible, that the representatives of the bourgeois women's movement achieve all their demands for equal rights with men, this would entail the abolition of the slavery that present-day marriage means for countless women, nor nor of prostitution, nor of the material dependence of the great majority of married women uh, on their husbands. Also, for the great majority of women, it makes no difference if some thousands, uh, tens of thousands, of their sisters who belong into the more favorably situated ranks of society succeed in attempting a superior profession or medical practice or some scientific or official career, for nothing is thereby challenged on the overall situation of the sex as a whole. The female sex in the mass suffers from the double burden. Firstly, women suffer by virtue in their social and, and societal dependence on men, and this would uh, certainly be ameliorated but not em eliminated by the former equal by the former uh, formal equality of rights before the law. Secondly, they suffer by virtue of the economic dependence, which is the lot of women. Uh, in general, and proletarian women in particular, as is true also for of proletarian men. Hence, it follows that all women, regardless of their position in society as a sex that has been oppressed, ruled and wronged by men throughout the course and development of our culture, have the common interest of doing away with the situation and of fighting to change it. Insofar as it can be changed through the changes in laws and institutions within the framework of the current of the existing uh, political and social order. But the huge majority of women are also most keenly interested in something more, in transforming the existing political and social order from the, gr from the ground up, in order to abolish both wage slavery, which afflicts the female proletariat most heavily, and sex slavery, which is very intimately bound up with our property and employment conditions. End quote. Hail Draper, Women in Class, Towards a Socialist Feminism. Hail, as Hail Draper did say, these kinds of things and this form of economic coercion and this idea of dependency affects to all women entirely. Not even just based off class, but especially the proletarian women, but since that affects the proletarian women, it also affects the proletarian men as well. Which basically means that in order to abolish patriarchy, and in order to abolish the patriarchal system of capitalism and what it produces, we need to be able to relate our struggle and be able to relate our fight against women's oppression and for women's liberation, both by women, but also in solidarity among men as well a part of the same class as the proletariat, the working class of the world, uniting together to fight against patriarchy as a whole. In the name of feminism, and this is the importance of feminism as a whole and the importance of the entirety of the political movement of feminism and what feminism is supposed to mean. It's not supposed to merely just put women in power within the current uh, political system as a whole because the current political system and the economic system uh, like oppress women entirely as a whole. Rather, the solution to the to this patriarchy and the solution to all patriarchy around the world in our current economic system today is to be able to fight against it with the with the women themselves able to declare their own freedoms and able to declare their own actions against patriarchy as a whole. And that is entirely what they're trying to fight for and what you know women and what the women's liberation movement, as in feminism, is supposed to fight for as well. 
even with women having the right to vote and even with many uh, opportun and even with many policies that allow women to have certain freedoms, uh, quote unquote freedoms, uh, that are basically insofar under the actual conditions of the bourgeois state is not enough. Because these freedoms are mostly declared by the bourgeois state in a bureaucracy made up of mostly men. Men deciding the issues for women. Men deciding the entire rights and freedoms for women. Not the women that are actually going through the struggle to actually declare that freedom for themselves. Because here's the thing about rights. Rights under capitalism aren't rights. They just call it that. What they are by function is our privileges given by the state. And that is why it's not rights, because the fact that our rights is decided by another institution that decides for us. In what way is that, is that natural rights? It is only our rights if we collectively and democratically decide ourselves of what that should be. And then give the gov and then give that to the governing body in which they enforce it, and our direct authority to them. That's not done today. Instead, we have a ruling class over a non-ruling class that has an authority over them through through violent through violent means, um, through uh, through legislative and judicial bodies carrying out that violence. As quoted by Hal Draper in *The Hidden History of the Equal Rights Amendment* by Hal Draper and St and uh, Stephen F. D and Diamond. Uh, they state, quote, The opponents introduced no qualifying amendment. The vote took place only for or against the pure business women's version of equal rights. The result was the amendment was defeated through the failure that get to, to the get to the required two thirds, but a majority of the senators voted in favor, 38 to 35. The large majority of of of, ye, of yeas were Republicans, and an overwhelming majority of the nays were Democrats. Plus the forget plus the progressive and lawful it. The central issue uh, is, clear, is clear in the course of the, of the debate. As one senator puts it, should the rights of women be equalized down or up? It was not an abstract issue. Through the, through the arguments tend to the formulated abstractly, Rat Rad Radcliffe of Maryland, um, the senator in charge of the floor managing the Equal Rights Amendment resolution, at one point responded unconsciously, and cautiously to the chart to the charge that the open-ended language would destroy a host of state laws favoring women women he stated gr uh, grandly are justly entitled to equality but no more the practical meaning for working women was the conditions that would be equalized down while some career women what might be uh, gainers uh, in upward equalization and upper eco ecological jobs opportunities there was an easy and common sense solution at one part of the problem, a solution supported by virtually every women's organization with the least pretense to liberalism. It was a tent of meaning of the, polit of the political lineup over the Equal Rights Amendment. The test was simply this, to pass a law with, with teeth providing for equal, right, for equal pay for equal work. Pass it now, not merely a promise action, in some future year when a constitutional amendment might one day be ratified by the states. End quote. Hale Draper, The Hidden History of the Equal Rights Amendment. Hale Draper is of course talking about the 19th Amendment I was talking about, the same amendment that gave the women the right to vote. But even then, this amendment only addressed so very little about the actual bureaucracy of the United States and only allowed women to be able to have certain equal rights as men uh, to a certain degree, um, actually uh, declared and actually um, made in decision for women in the bourgeois state, which is why the women themselves are not actually in power within the structure, but merely they were add, uh, merely to add pressure into the bourgeois state um, to be able to give them this. This doesn't mean that they actually have power, however. It actually means that basically they have actually a lack of power. This only shows the actual uh, prop, the more and more problems within the current political system of the United States and why it's very much undemocratic and very much not free at all. The only way for democracy and for freedom to actually be able to be declared for women is when the women themselves are able to take part into this action against capitalism and against this patriarchal bureaucracy and economic system under capitalism as a whole. 
and that coincides with the actual struggle between men and women among the working class in order for them to be free uh, entirely. Because with the emancipation of the proletariat, as we said in the introduction of this work, the rest of the world shall be emancipated with it. To quote Lenin on this issue, quote, The thesis that we must emphasize strongly is the true emancipation of women is not possible except through communism. You must lay stress on the unbreakable connection between women's human and social position and the private ownership of the means of production. This will draw a strong and ir irritable line against the bourgeois movement for the quote-unquote emancipation of women. This will also give us a basis for examining the women question as a part of the social working class question, and to bind it firmly with the proletarian class struggle and the revolution. The communist women's movement itself must be a mass movement, a part of the general mass movements, and not only of the pro but not only of the proletarians, but all of the exploited and oppressed of all victims of capitalism or of the dominant class. Therein too lies the significance of the communist society. We can legitimately uh, proud uh, that we have the flower of revolutionary womanhood in our party, in the common turn. But it, this is not a decisive. But this is not decisive. We have to win over. We have to win over the millions of working women in town and country for our struggle, and particularly for the communist reconstruction of society. There can be no real mass movement without the women. We derive our organizational ideas from our ideological conceptions. We want, we want no separate organizations of communist women. She, she, she who is a communist belongs to a member of the party, just as he who is a communist. They have the same rights and duties. There can be no difference of opinion on the, on the score. However, we must not shut our eyes to the facts. The party must have organs of working groups, commissions, committees, sections, or whatever else they may be called uh, with the specific purpose of arousing the broad masses of women, bringing them into contact with the party and keeping them under its influence. This naturally requires that we carry on a, a systematic uh, work among the women, and we must teach the awakened women uh, win them over for the proletarian class struggle under the leadership of the Communist Party and equip them for it. When I say I have in mind not only for not only proletarian women, rather they work in mills or cook the family meal. End quote. Vladimir Lenin on the women's question. The only the only way where women can be able to truly be liberated is if the women themselves liberate themselves. The self-emancipation of women that also coincides and stands in solidarity with the self-emancipation of the proletariat. This comes about into the next problem within the United States and the, and the next marginalized group that is being oppressed due to these certain policies being basically basked by the United States. Transgender people. Transgender people nowadays and our current oppression today that I would like to cover more it now is that... Basically, is that with, as transgender people, since even the conception of the United States of America, the like of women, have actually played a dominant role into actually changing society and actually have played a dominant role into actually for this country and actually being able to actually do some things good for this country and also for many other things around the world. Yet they are undermining their actual significance in the hall they play. In fact, transgender people are more likely to be attacked or are more likely to actually face harassment and assault compared to cisgender people around the world. In the United States, for example, transgender people are more likely, especially Latino, especially Latina and Latino transgender people, are actually more likely to then basically be human trafficked compared to cisgendered uh, people within the United States. The same actually even goes for Mexico, too. And this is under the predicated idea that basically transgender people are people that have a mental illness or that they are people that basically don't know what they're talking about. When this is completely wrong and it completely misunderstands the entire concept of what gender and biological sex is in the first place. Gender in its early definition and its very essential conception um, under the actual, even the emergence of class society, is under the idea actually of the personality traits that one might have that displays current characters of femininity and masculinity that one can have towards others. 
An example of this is an is an example of this is actually gender expression. You can essentially express gender and express certain forms of gender uh, orientation based off the actual personality traits that you can have. Basically, based off your personality traits that is defined um, based off a masculine trait or a feminine trait, and depending on that, which basically creates an entire spectrum of different gender expressions that one can have compared to another that can allow to infinite amount of genders basically being able to you know being able to actually express itself. This has been the case with many societies, actually, within class societies, such as Japan, such as Japan, China, uh, Persia, and actually even the Roman Empire as well, where there, uh, where there is actually considered multiple gender expressive uh, traits that one can have um, that basically does not necessarily uh, define someone to just be declared as either a man or a woman. Because gender, as an expressive term, is an expe is in a spectrum that basically allows for different people to basically have different traits compared to another based off masculine and feminine uh, personality traits. This is even this is even prominent within uh, Greek states, even in and even in Greek states such as Sparta, where women where women uh, that had very very much masculine traits weren't even usually considered women, but were considered basically an their own. Uh, gender and their own actual gender expressive uh, structure and this could actually be uh, applied to many other societies entirely so what changed what changed is the idea of basically marriage and also the idea of basically male dependency that feudalism and capitalism was establishing through the ideas of marriage and creating this idea of basically dependency uh, that women must have to men, it basically creates an idea that basically each feminine trait and especially each current like physical traits that women might have, and even the biological sex based off based off the X X chromosomes and X Y chromosome uh, characterization, basically would have to basically define uh, the gender of man and woman no longer considered basically a spectrum like it has throughout history and like how it is throughout the very conception of the concept of, of gender in the first place, now gender was basically synonymously intertwined with the idea of biological sex. Because of this, it created a false narrative, it created false ideas about this entire uh, situation, it created a false like entire structure about this entire um, idea of basically, uh, of basically only two gender uh, spectrum that... It basically was able to have an idea that basically women are the ones that basically cook and are able the ones that are that are able to you know make uh, decisions, uh, are the ones that basically have decisions decided for them, while men are able to want, are the ones that basically go out and work and actually um, you know do everything and basically have the ability to you know uh, control women in that certain degree, which is completely wrong and completely negates the entire point of what gender even supposed to be is supposed to be even during the emergence of gender in the first place uh, and the concept of that within East Asian uh, class societies. This is very much prominent today where throughout the United States history except until 2015, the United States has always basically defined gender either based off male and female, completely destroying the, the synonymous idea of what, gen, of what gender expression is supposed to be in the first place. And many conservative politicians, such as Ben Shapiro uh, and Jordan Peterson, still argue that basically biological sex is synonymous between gender expression and gender spectrum. When in reality that is not even the case and it also is ahistorical from what the actual term of gender actually comes from and even the conception of gender as it is in the first place as well. And even if we were to basically understand that basically gender is the same as sex and many other things are, are the same as well, this is also ignoring the different syndromes that basically intersect that basically causes intersex chromosomes to basically uh, intertwine itself to the point where even if we were to actually define um, different um, different people based off the actual sex that they might have, based off the actual chromosomes that they might have between X and Y. Um, we can actually find that basically, even if we were to basically apply this chromosome structure, it's actually very much interpretive because there's multiple syndromes and there's even, an, and there's actually even two new discovered chromosomes that have been discovered in 2017 that actually would no longer basically try to define uh, people based off like a male or female, uh, male, male or female based off biological sex. An example of this is the XXY chromosome syndrome. The YYX chromosome syndrome, the XXYY chromosome syndrome, the 
YXXY chromosome syndrome, and many other different combinations between uh, different chromosomes having towards each other that basically causes actually different intersex structures like within a person that basically actually allows more people to basically... Um, it actually allows more people to actually not even consider male or female, but be considered an entirely different sex when you basically analyze these chromosomes. As well as the fact it's also uh, under, and also as well as the fact we need to understand the existence of the of the Z chromosome and the G chromosome, which basically allows different uh, people to basically have different chromosomes in a way where basically um, they can no longer basically be defined and basically be limited to basically the sex of what is considered as male or female because of these different chromosomes that people might have and that and people do intend to have a lot uh, without even knowing it once you analyze further of the chromosome structure. And the and the ribosome structure of the of the of the given human person, which not only leaves the very concept of biological sex interpretive, but also actually justifies the idea of gender expression theory and gender spectrum that was an emergence since the very emergence of class society in the first place, where it is able to actually allow people to just freely and basically go by a so social construct of personality traits between ma between masculinity and femininity on their personality traits, which basically causes an entire spectrum of of, gen of gender orientation and gender transition that people might have uh, in in their in their uh, in their personality. As well as the fact that we also need to understand that gender dysphoria is an actual real thing and is actually something that people actually go through quite a lot. And the only known solution to gender dysphoria uh, is actually by um, actually by applying uh, what the, uh, the desires of the person that is going through gender dysphoria into basically becoming the sex or and the gender that they basically desire to be. Which we are able to do thanks to the thanks to gender transition gen, thanks to trans, gender transition surgery that has been able to actually be introduced in 1993. But th this surgery is still very much expensive among many people among among the United States and actually around the world as well to the point where people where many people will still suffer through gen through gender dysphoria and not be able to actually be the gender that basically think in their that think in their minds and it is indeed actually a real thing. It's like being, it's like waking up one day and actually thinking that you are just not yourself, that you are literally abstracted from who you are and like what you are. And it's constant agony that people basically have to go through night and day, basically thinking that they are stuck, that they are a person stuck in another person's body and they don't want to actually do that. They don't want to actually be that. And it's an actual real um, thing that basically people go through, an active struggle that people go through. And the known solution is to actually be able to... Uh, basically apply that um that entire uh gender transition that they desire into practice but it's not a but it's so hard for people to actually do that especially transgender people now because because we live in a society where we are so predicated to money to the point where it basically makes up our very distribution system in our everyday life in our everyday wake of life as well to the point it limits the actual ability for people to actually be able to apply and to be able to actually put into practice on what gender and what and what expression that they essentially desire in the first place. Completely alienating people from the ability in which they could be able to be free and alienating people away from the actual ability in which they could be able to uh, express themselves into a certain way. And I don't even want to say that I basically know everything about this because there's even stuff that I don't even know that trans that transgender people might know a lot more because they are actively going through the struggle. I'm a cisgender I'm a cisgender Hispanic male, and I'm not necessarily uh, prone to basically speak for even women or uh, transgender people in the first place about this subject. But what is known is that these people go through an active struggle and go through an active constant pain every day when they basically um, when they basically are harassed, are violently brutalized, or are basically told that they are not who they are actively by the systematic structure and the, and the systemic structure of the United States' laws, especially with laws that are basically hindering the ability for transgender people to be able to become the gender expression, the, 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 the gender that basically they desire to be, such as in Texas, Arizona, and others. So much so that they will even limit the rights and abilities for transgender people to even participate in basic activities such as sports. An example here in Arizona, a, a, an anti-transgender uh, legislation was actually passed uh, in Arizona around March and April of 2022. 
uh, to the point where basically um, transgender people and schools are no longer able to participate in school activities and sports activities as well. It's, it's gotten so bad to the point where basically, where basically coaching staff and school staff and police have the ability to actually search the genitalia of, trans, of transgender kids in order to make sure that they're cisgendered. Which is basically legalizing the ability for, po the poli for the police and coaching staff to commit pedophilia against children in the name of basically finding out someone's uh, being cisgendered or not. They might even basically not even do a physical because they might accuse basically the physical of basically falsifying basically their gender and their actual quote unquote biological sex orientation to the point where they basically give permission to the coaching staff and the police to actually search the genitalia of transgender kids or, or just kids in general to make sure that they're either transgender or cisgendered. Completely legalizing the ability for people to basically uh, commit pedophilia against kids. This is what is going on around the United States and this part of Arizona, and this is only an example of what's going on in Arizona. A similar bill was passed in Texas with way worse conditions, as well as something that has the same in Ohio with actually the same exact predications, the exact same requirements as Arizona, which is causing more harm and actually causing more violence and causing more destruction and more depression among transgender among transgender kids which is all which transgender kids are already one of the highest to basically commit suicide in the United States as it is already and it's because of policies like this and it's because of the entire um, systemic structure that that the United States has and that the world has towards um, people uh, that are transgender um, that ha has to the point where basically they are limited so far away from their entire uh, bodily autonomy to even be declared on who they who themselves on who they are in the first place. We must be able to relate this struggle and and be able to actually show that basically the transgender people as well and transgender liberation has to come from the transgender people themselves to be able to liberate themselves as well and that this has to come down to what they to what they need to do as well and that what they should be able to actually declare freedom for themselves by themselves of themselves. As stated by a transgender activist and uh, by transgender Marxist activist uh, and Marxist theorist uh, Laura Miles, quote, trans oppression, like other oppressions, is bound up by the per with the production of value and profit under capitalism. The, con the contributors to transgender Marxism offer robust alternatives to both liberal and ident and identity theory approaches that currently dominate trans rights activism. Queer theory, privilege theory, and identity theory approaches fail. Identity uh, theory approaches fail to recognize class conflict and the exploitation as the sources of the structural and, in, and, and institutional oppressions. They also fail uh, to the center of the working class in its struggles and the revolutionary potential of the agent of liberation. Instead, they tend to assume the, uh, that cisgender people can be, can be at best only allies in the fight for trans rights. In contrast, Marxists recognize that although trans people have a right to organizational autonomy, working class cisgender people also have the objective interest in fighting transphobia. Failing to do so is a determinant, is a determinantal, uh, for, is determinantal for the entire working class. The key to liberation, therefore, is solidarity within the working class between trans and non-trans people and between all oppressed groups. Adherence to identity politics approaches among anti-oppression activists must be addressed with sensitivity by Marxists. Given that the very low levels of working class struggle for many decades, it is up, up, unsurprising that the power of workers is unclear to many, especially younger activists. When discussing how trans liberation can be achieved, Marxists need example need examples of the power of workers' action. We also need a capacity to explain the identity politics and various liberal solutions, such as getting more trans, black, and female faces into high pl uh, places, are ultimately inadequate tools for liberation, even if they are understandable rea reactions to oppression. Proposed solutions based off such politics will, inevitab will inevitably remain trapped within the capitalist mode of production and privatized property relations. Marx has recognized that reactionary agendas, movements, are only fought effectively by the mass resistance from the below, and ultimately by the working class resisting the ex its exploitation and oppression in order to fight for a systemic uh, transformation. Laurel Miles, Marxism, Moral Panic, and the War on Trans People. 
So, every, yeah, guys, that's uh, that's uh, part uh, two of the uh, of the video. I'm gonna make a part three video of this entire series soon. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for uh, watching this video, uh, and I hope you enjoyed. Uh, uh, hit the subscribe button if you're new to my channel and you enjoy my content. Uh, also hit the like button if you like this video as well. And yeah, uh, sorry for the storm that basically was around in basically the second half of the video. Um, you know, that's I can't really control the weather. Uh, but yeah, I even tried to edit some some of the stuff out. But yeah, uh, thank you guys for watching and uh, have a good one.